Um, I want to start by uh, apologizing because I'm bringing to the discussion a very Western perspective. Of course, I'm from, I'm from Europe. Uh, and I work in North America, and my research is based in, in Europe and North America, so it's quite different from uh, a, a southern uh, perspective, maybe, <coughs> uh, probably, uh, or, or an eastern perspective. Uh, but when I decided to say these this words to, to start this, this conversation, I realized that my, uh, actually my, my talk today is much more geographically narrow than that, because I'm going to focus on, on Italy, and in particular on my old school, uh, CISA, the International School for Advanced Study in, Studies in Trieste. So it's very, uh, if you want, uh, um, a link to my personal experience in a sense, but it's also a, a, case, study that, a case study that I will present, uh, which has had global effects, and I, I think it will bring to the discussion something broader than, than CISA, the CISA school in Trieste. Um, of course, it's an honor to speak after, after Paul David, which, is, which has uh, brought to us this, uh, this broad and, and very deep view on, on the evolution of open science. And uh, I'm, I'm going to draw a, very, a much smaller picture. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on just, just on one side of the open science spectrum. So as, as uh, uh, Sarita said, open science can, can be considered as, as, a, as an umbrella term that includes several different kinds of practices and processes and, and institutions. And I'm going to focus t t today in particular on open access, and in particular on the, on the birth of open access publishing back in the early 90s, so what the, the, the years that somebody has called the pioneering years of, of online publishing, of online scholarly publishing. Um, Okay, so I wanted to, to start with this question. So is, is open science a revolution or does it represent uh, a rather a continuity of, of processes that have been going, have been going on for, for centuries now? Um, I think we're in the middle of a sort of an unprecedented re renegotiation of the scientific enterprise. And as we adv advocate for change, as, as it's happening in this, in, uh, ac across this seminar, uh, we, must, we must also take into account the, ro the robustness uh, and even the resistance of the, uh, the scholarly communication system. Uh, so 20 years after the, the, the emergence of the World Wide Web, uh, which was invented by scientists in a scientific institution and created and diffused by, by, by scientific institutions, uh, I think as science is still slow uh, in adapting and, and uh, the evolution of, for example, collective online, online creation. It, does, it doesn't drive it anymore. Uh, so the, the, the innovation in that field is, is rather left to the corporate digital world. Uh, so my, my, my first idea is that, is that maybe at the very least the open science change that we discussed at the seminar uh, might take lots of time and resources in order to establish itself as a new paradigm. Uh, if, if by open science we mean uh, distributed, uh, collective, cooperative, uh, uh, transnational and participatory uh, form of knowledge production. <coughs> So I wanted to, again, to start from the idea that the social contract of sciences is, is, a, is a, in, in a crisis, is experiences an overall crisis. Uh, let's say that the so-called normal science, which, which emerged after, after World War II uh, through, through a social and political agreement, um, is, is, has been in, in, in undergoing a transformation at very least since the 70s. It's, it's a broader transformation, which, which of course includes uh, government, governance and, and production systems. So I'm talking about the post-industrial society or the so-called information society, the increased role of information and knowledge and communication in, a, in our, in our, in our uh, uh, industrial, industrialized societies. Uh, as, as we know, uh, increased presence of private money in basic research, uh, new governance models, uh, new forms, of increased role for intellectual property rights, uh, uh, technological innovation, which is more mixed with, with basic research. Uh, so the crisis that I, that I point to uh, is both in terms of the results of science, uh, so uh, its, its productivity has, has been questioned, the, 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 its ability to solve global, global problems, I, just wa I, wa I wanna just mention the, the ecological crisis or, the, or, or climate change. But on the other side, there is also uh, a crisis of its moral economy or of its morality. Uh, in, in some fields of science, this is, this is very visible, for example, in the life sciences. Patents on life, the so-called so -called patents on life, the, uh, 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 decreased accountability, uh, increased privatization, increased global inequality, also driven by, by scientific and technological innovation. 
Um, in this framework, uh, of course, the change that OpenSign is bringing to the table is not just te technological. We're not just talking about a new, te new communication technology. This is uh, Paul's, of course, uh, uh, talk, which has, uh, which has explained this uh, much better than they could, they could ever do. Uh, te technology is a precondition for change, but then social, so societal, uh, economic, and political change are also, are also quite important. So this seminar is hopefully uh, going to be a place where this, this change discuss, is discussed in all these nuances. Nuances, I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, so one of my, I, one of the ideas that I wanted to present to you is that uh, openness is a sort of a force that remoralizes science during this crisis. Uh, and the cultures of openness are crucial and very powerful in this change. Uh, not only because they provide technical alternatives, so more distributed and maybe more productive way of, of organizing knowledge production, uh, but also because they are a source of critique uh, to old models of scientific production. Uh, critique to institutional practices and organization, cri critiques, critique to power dynamics, uh, to monopolies and incumbents. Uh, so open science, do, open science does provide a metaphor uh, for change, but it also provides, uh, according to me, uh, a, a new, it sort of makes science moral again. Just an example, uh, synthetic biology, which is explicitly incorporating uh, Culture, cultures and practices coming from free software and, and, and hacking in order to present biotech in a new, li in a new li light from a point of view of its political accountability, its social uh, impact, and so on. Um, so I think that those cultures of openness that, 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 are, that are able to, in, in a way, remoralize science allow uh, us, uh, activists of open science, to seek reform or even rock the boat a little bit uh, by pos at the very least by posing new questions and challenges. Uh, per, for example, to, to concentrations of power that are typical of modern science. Um, uh, so what, what, I, what I want to do tonight is to, is to present uh, in, in, in within, this, within this general uh, idea of the, 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 the cultural role of, of openness uh, in, in changing in scientific institutions. Um, I want to try and present and provide a small piece of sort of a genealogy of open science, uh, nothing as, as broad as, as Paul's uh, presentation, of course, but I think that uh, I, I, even though it's, it's a small case study, uh, it, it does highlight the importance of understanding open science from, from, the, from the genealogical viewpoint, so understand how um, openness operates in, in, within, within science and where the scientific enterprise uh, shows more stability and resistance and where uh, change is, more, is, is easier and, and faster. Uh, it's a bit unfair maybe to present this case study because it's, uh, uh, it's only, again, one specific side of open science, so open access scholarly communication. Um, because it's based in Italy, even though it has a, it has a global scope, of course, and because it's a, it's a specific disciplinary field, uh, which is a bit exoteric and maybe a bit removed from, for example, development, uh, open development issues that other, other panels are going to discuss, uh, which is particle physics. Um, still, I think that this, this might provide some insight into the, into the, the evolution of open science. Uh, so we're going to talk about high energy physics, so physical research that comes mostly from particle accelerators. Uh, it's a, in a way in a very, a very wealthy discipline. Uh, it has a relationship, as you know, with military uh, technological innovation historically. Um, it's also kind of uh, circumscribed, uh, in, in particular in, in, the, in, the, in the field I'm going to explore today. We're talking about a, a discipline which, which only has a handful of journals. So it's not, we don't have 2,000 journals as the life sciences, for example. Um, and then it's interesting because, the, because of, the, of the co-evolution of high energy physics and the World Wide Web. So the, the fact that World Wide, World Wide Web was born at, at CERN uh, as, as, a, as a project of communication within uh, high energy physics uh, scientists. Uh, it's also interesting because it has a very well-established well form of, of open communication, which is the archive. How many of you are familiar with the archive? 
Okay, so it's, it's a preprint server. It's a, it's a website where since 1991, if I'm not wrong, and even before, and under different names, uh, physicists, not, not, not only them, but also mathematicians and so on, uh, upload their preprints. So those are studies, articles that, are not, that have, haven't been sub submitted for publication yet or haven't been accepted for publication yet. So as soon as the, the article is ready, they just upload it to the, to the archive and then it's there in the open and anyone can, can go and read them. Uh, this is different from other disciplines. Uh, so there is already an open system of communication which is well established, which is the, the way, the, the media, the medium they use. So it's very common for physicists to uh, wake up, go to the office, quite often they sleep there, actually, uh, uh, and, and for first thing in the morning, check the, the archive for, the, for their own sub-discipline, uh, new, new stuff which is coming up. And it contains, I think, at this point, millions of articles. Is that right? Is anybody? Millions. Oh yeah, and this is from a few months ago, so maybe we're getting there. <laughs> I was close though. <coughs> uh, okay, so any initiative in, in, in scholarly public pub pub publication in particle physics, of course, is, is in relation with, with the archive, of course. It's also interesting because th there is a flagship uh, uh, project, open access project, which is the Scope 3, cons the Scope 3 project. It's a sponsoring consortium for open access publishing in particle physics. Uh, it's, it's, it's been operating since January 1st this year, and basically the major institutions uh, that represent f particle physics research uh, and high energy physics research, uh, particle physics research, are, 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 have switched the field almost completely. So now the, the whole, the, uh, more than 80% of, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the articles that, uh, that are published right now, that, that, will, that will, be, will be published in the next years, will be right away uh, open access because basically they, they, they asked, they involved um, even commercial publishers and, and, the, and all, all kind of the, the, the most important journals of the discipline in this scheme, which is basically a, a different way of allocating resources. So the consortium gets the money from those, those institutions in those countries, uh, and instead of allocating this money to libraries that then pay the fee for, for, for accessing the, the, the journals, uh, Scope 3 uh, pays for an article that is published by, by any researcher in the world. So uh, they basically set up prices, so we know that I don't know, I, I don't know the, the exact prices, but maybe to publish, they decided together with the publishers that nuclear physics B is, is worth $1,500. So if a researcher from, those, from one of those countries publish, uh, submits an article to nuclear physics B, then the, the, the scope three, once, it, once the article is accepted, pays the, 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 the journal with, with the collective money that, that it has gathered. Uh, is this clear? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the case study I'm going to present to to today is the Journal of High Energy Physics. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, it's a quite an important journal in, in the field. It, it's, it's now one of the three uh, top journals, I want to say, so in terms of impact factor and, and visibility within the, among the, within the community. Uh, it was, the idea was born in around 1993, if I'm not wrong, and in 1994 the first issue was published. Uh, again, it's, it's in the early days of, of electronic publishing, so it wasn't even called open access uh, yet, so because the, 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 the definition came, came a, few year, a few years later. Uh, and the idea was, was, was born at CISA, which is the institution I, 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 where I studied, and was funded by, by public institutions in Italy, and basically it was uh, uh, managed by a small group of, of physicists from CISA. Uh, it's still one of the top journals. Um, I think that the processes that I'm going to describe for, for, for the birth of this journal are pretty much similar to other experiences that have come uh, later, but even before. But this one is one of the first ones that established itself as, as one of the core journals of its discipline, and 20 years later is, 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 still, is still healthy and, and powerful, if you want. Uh, Okay, so in describing the, this process, I'm going to use some metaphors taken from computer science because uh, I'm a bit uh, uh, nerdy and because the, 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 the scientists that I interviewed for, 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 this, uh, for this research are, of course, physicists and so they also are computer scientists. And so they used these, these terms during the interviews to refer not to technical uh, processes but rather to, 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 to societal or organizational processes. Um, 
So I thought I would adopt those terms as well because they're, very, they're, they're quite fine. They describe very, describe very well what happened. So the first one is forking. I don't know if you know what forking is. In a, with a, in, a, in a free software community, if you're not happy with the direction that the, the, the software that you're designing is, 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 has taken, you can fork the project. So you just take the, the, the software and, the, uh, uh, and take it to, 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 to different directions. You start your own uh, fork. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a tree of life. So you differentiate, uh, you evolve and dif differentiating uh, the, the software or whatever it is. Um, so in this case, this is something that was happening at the time. This, the context is, is a situation in which uh, several journals and, uh, um, happened to, to go through the so-called declarations of independence. So uh, whole editorial boards were publicly declaring that they were uh, uh, quitting the journal and, and forking it. So they were creating a new journal, for example, it started, I think, according to my information, in 1989. So the Vegetatio, or the editorial board, resigned. They quit the journal. They started a new journal called uh, uh, Vegetation Science. So basically, the same journal was the journal was forked. Uh, so this is what happened basically with JHAP. So there, there wasn't a, there wasn't orig an original journal, but they, they kind of forked from the, the, the journals that were at the time established. So Physical Letters B and, and Physics Review uh, B, if I'm not wrong, were, were, the, were the most important at the time. Um, the reasons for this forking were, uh, um, which, which, was, which, was, which was done in public, so it was discussed in, in, even in those journals and in scientific journals uh, publicly within the community, uh, were a reaction to the, to the monopoly of, of commercial publishers. So in particular, Elsevier, which, which was perceived uh, as an evil player already 20 years ago. Um, uh, of course, physicists were providing free labor because because of the peer review they do for free and the editorial work they do what they were doing for they were doing for free. So the first thing that they, they had to do with this forking was to convince the to, to do co sort of a community building process. So they convinced mm -hmm. the community that they, that they needed a new journal, which was, as they said, a journal by scientists uh, uh, for scientists. So they presented it as a creation, as a like sort of a grassroots creation from the community. So they managed to involve. Uh, lots of uh, important physicists, which, which means asking them to, to do editorial work, but also to submit their papers, which is the only way to uh, kickstart a, a new journal. Uh, um, it's interesting because openness and, and the, the reaction to, to, to the commercial publishers was used as a way to eticize, in a way, this new project and to coagulate scholars around it. So it was like uh, uh, important in that sense. Uh, one of their goals, though, it was to acquire or improve their control over communication uh, dynamics. Uh, so they, they really wanted to acquire a central position in the community. And the, uh, starting a new journal was key in that, in that sense. The second process was migration. I don't know if you want to know what the migration is, but it's what you, you migrate a system to a new software. Uh, it's a very dangerous, uh, by the way, process. If you're a computer scientist, you know which, which, that it's, it's a pain in the neck. Uh, uh, in their own words, we migrated a pre-existing system on, onto a new technology. Uh, so even though they had lots of opportunities in terms of innovating the journal model, uh, it's, it's 1994, the, the web is there, you, you, you have created it. You, you, you are, you're, not, you're not only a, scient a scientist, but you're a coder. Uh, you have the archive already, which is a, which is a great uh, uh, place which stores all knowledge pr produced in your field. Um, and this is not just something I, I, I'm proposing, like in, in uh, um, how, to, how, do you say, how do you say this? Uh, I'm not just inventing possibilities, like in retrospective. The, the, those, those things were proposed. So for example, somebody proposed to, to, to uh, build the journal as, as an overlay to the archives. So instead of opening a new journal, you would, JHAP will be uh, sort of, a, uh, sort of, we will sort of crawl and browse uh, articles that were on the archive already, and then it will stamp it or rate the article as JHAP approved or something like that. This, this was a sort of a radical idea for the, for the time, and uh, it was met with resistance and refused. And they, they came, they even came to the point of uh, uh, creating tensions in the collective, which was managing, managing the journal, because the, the core uh, and the most, the most powerful uh, uh, people were uh, really wanted to do an old style journal, really wanted to do an electronic journal, but with the same peer review, editorial board, publication process, and so on and so forth. So the transformative potential of the web was, was, was downplayed, even though they had uh, some tools to, to imagine and perform some, some innovation in that field. So this is what media scholars 
called remediation. Uh, an old media is, is transformed or, or is migrated in, in onto a new media. Uh, a newspaper is not printed on paper only, but is also on the web, but it's still, it's still the same newspaper. Um, so the question is, is that is if those transformations were just premature for, premature for the time, or if the, the scientific journal is what somebody called a, a zombie media, so a media that we keep on, we keep, we keep on uh, announcing its death, as television, for example, or, or, or many other media, media uh, but it keeps on being alive even though it's dead. Uh, it's the same for the archive, in a sense, because uh, the archive is nothing but the evolution of a practice that, that, that had been going on for decades for particle physicists, so they would have boards on a wall, uh, they would they will mail, mail to each other their preprints by pieces of paper, and they would uh, simply nail the paper to the, to the board and people will, will consult them and they will, they will write back with responses and so on. The third process is rebooting, another very dangerous process. Uh, so uh, if you restart your, your operative system. Uh, the the JHAP was actually restarted several times. Uh, it, it passed from, from openness to, to, to closeness and then to openness again. Uh, at a certain point it was uh, it ended up by being uh, operated by Springer. So it's still owned by CISA, but it's actually operated by Springer. And it was closed until Jan January 1st this year when it, when it joined Scope 3, so it became open again and under, the, under that funding scheme. So after only a few years, I think it was, it was open access for three or four years, they just decided that their goals were met and openness was not their goal. Openness was not the goal per se. Uh, also because of peculiarities of the discipline. We don't read journals, was their, was their mantra when, 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 I, when I interviewed them. Uh, they have the archive. The, the journal is something they need to, to, to verify uh, and certify knowledge that is produced by, by particle physicists, but they don't, they don't go and download papers from journals. Uh, so there wasn't a political commitment to openness, and this is uh, uh, interesting for, for me, but openness was very important for them to, in order to acquire trust, uh, and, and to gather collaboration, to mobilize the community. It was sort of, sort of their flag uh, to, to show that you could do that in the open. It, it, would, it was free. It wasn't, okay? it wasn't even uh, green open access, so authors would, would, didn't have to pay for to publish uh, their papers. Um, but it was dropped, openness, after JHAP established itself as one of the core journals. At that point, openness was not an important tool anymore. They were able to, uh, to uh, pass to, 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 a new, to a new step. Uh, and, and simply change the, 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 moda the modality of, of distribution of, of their papers. Um, so I think it's very interesting that why we might perceive this as a, as a history of a failure. I think it's more something that's, that shows the stability of science's communication system. So uh, to, see, to see it as a failure would be a very uh, activist viewpoint that we will adapt in order to describe this just as a failure. Uh, I think it's, it's more useful to see it as an example of, again, the, the, the stability and even resistance sometimes of, of the established uh, models of scholarly communication. So I, I wouldn't blame my physicist at CISA for, for choosing that the, the, the JHAP didn't have to be open. Uh, it's very difficult to shake a system of knowledge production and circulation that, as Paul has shown, was stabilized over three centuries, and it's very important uh, for example, the, the, the fact that the papers are individual, they have a clear, clear identifiable author or, or authors, they're peer-reviewed, they're certified by prestigious editorial board, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult to shake such, such a, such a uh, stable and, and, and strict form of validating knowledge. <clears throat> it's the same if you want to, if you want to take further this, this genealogical uh, path that I've been taking, uh, it's, it's the same for Scope 3. So Scope 3 doesn't question or challenge the cycle of credit, the system of incentives, the organizational principles of, of, the, of the, 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 the scientific field, the system of evaluation or review. It's just a new way of allocating resources. It's, diff, it's an increased control of scientific bureaucracies over, over the publication process. Uh, uh, it kind of freezes the market because now journals have, 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 a, uh, have a price that it's, it's been uh, kind of frozen, so they, they have to, to they, if they want to increase the, they increase the price for, for papers that they publish, they have to go and renegotiate re 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 that with the whole uh, consortium. <clears throat> okay, so the question, the, moving out of high energy physics and particle physics is that w why only 20 years after somebody started journals with those possibilities, we, we, we start have seeing mega journals 
uh, uh, open peer review, alternative metrics, and all the things we're going to discuss uh, as, as the, the, the open questions of this seminar. So this, this is a question I leave open to discussion, of course, because I don't have the answer. Uh, it's very interesting to see, according to me, if, this, if more radical transformations such as uh, uh, do-it-yourself approach it to science, crowdsourcing in science, new forms of collaboration that happen in the open, uh, wiki science, and so on and so forth, will be able to actually become uh, a, a, an hege hegemonic pr paradigm of, of knowledge production. Uh, and this is also because I want to propose the idea that open science is, is a threat. Uh, it, it does contribute to uh, restructure some societal and power relationship within, 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 the, within the scientific field. Uh, and it, represent again, it represents again an, a threat to the social contract of science. So at least two things I want to mention. A threat to the cognitive authority of science, so the, of science. Uh, so the ability to claim that knowledge produced in scientific institutions is, institutions is better than other types of knowledge. So what's going to happen when science 2.0 or open science is going to show that scientific knowledge can be always beta because it's always incrementable uh, or it's negoti negotiated among different types of, uh, uh, for example, social groups. And then it's also a threat to the role of science in, uh, in liberal societies. Uh, the way knowledge is produced is, of course, a key part of the economic uh, political and even military, or military order of our societies. Uh, so the risk, according to me, is that this transformation, this transformation might, might be uh, only partial and or it might take decades to actually uh, become, uh, to, to stabilize. Uh, so mo other than technological change and, and activism in, in this field and even uh, uh, scientists' different approaches to openness, uh, I think that deep, a more deeper so, 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 so social political change is needed. And this is arguably already happening uh, and might in, in, in the digital world and digital corporations, uh, where everything is happening in other fields of information and, 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 and knowledge production. And it, it, it could, of course, favor a systemic change also in science, uh, including then at this point also funding, the, rewarding syst the reward system, the system of autoreality, uh, the new forms of public negotiation of science, if it's done in the open, in the sense not only of sharing information, but also of, of opening up the boundaries of who can decide about which science we should produce and how. Uh, okay, so to, to conclude, I can't, I can't really answer to the question, what's the, what, what, what's the future of open science? And I hope this seminar will actually propose some, some of those futures and we will be able to discuss them, um, the, the incentives and, and goals of future open science. Um, um, I just want to conclude by saying that this, if, if a systemic change is to happen, uh, this has to, in, to include, uh, to, to involve, as, as, as we, 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 we heard, we've heard before, major shifts in, in the economic structure of science. And so we should be, should be wondering who can fund uh, a systemic change for open science. And I think that the two actors that we have uh, uh, now uh, in sight are, of course, uh, public, public funding, so the state, uh, so st state, pat state patronage, uh, or the digital capital, so digital corporations. And in both cases, we run the risk of building not a more distributed and democratic science, but rather a more concentrated uh, way of producing science. So if we, if we, if we think about uh, digital capitalism, we're talking about institutions that, that accumulate an incredible concentration of wealth and power. Um, I'm finished. <laughs> um, Okay, so I want, just wanted to encourage uh, the, the crowd here to, to think uh, further um, than this, I mean, to think n not only about the distinction between all the opposition between open and closed, and closed science, but also about economic and power relationships in the, in the scientific field. And uh, thanks, obrigado. And, uh, well, good afternoon. I hope you're still awake. Uh, and I'll try not to put you to sleep. Um, I know it's a long afternoon, and if you're confused about what open science is, I don't blame you. I, I'm really confused myself, too. Uh, so let's try to unpack some of these questions about open science to see if we can come to some common understanding of what, uh, whether we have some common language, ideas, principles with which we could begin to explore uh, common issues uh, and tackle common problems. Uh, but before I do that, I want to also thank the organizers, Sarita, uh, Luca, Alex, uh, Annie, and, and all those other involved in putting together this very interesting seminar. 
uh, many interesting people from different disciplines with very, very different backgrounds and interests uh, and highly, highly interdisciplinary. So I uh, applaud mm -hmm. you for putting this, uh, this workshop together uh, and for um, uh, and, and for inviting us. Thank you very much. And also want to say that this is not my first time in Brazil. In fact, I've been coming to this country for close to 20 years now, but I'm ashamed to admit that uh, I have only know how to say a few words of, uh, of Portuguese, one of which is Caperinha. So, uh, <laughs> and I think our, 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 our translators deserves extra one or two of those after this afternoon because I know they have a very tough job. So uh, uh, applause to you all. So, <laughs> and when I told my, my, my wife that I was coming to Rio earlier this year when I was invited, she said, Dan, you're going to go see the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I wish, you know, I, I love the Brazilian team. And I, 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 my condolences to all of you. And I, I, I hope Neymar is doing a lot better right now. I, I hope he's recovering. So next time. So he's still young. <laughs> anyway, so uh, as I said, I've been, I've been coming to this country because I've been working with colleagues in Campinas uh, in, in, on a project called uh, BioLine International. Uh, it is from that project and from working with my colleagues in Brazil and from other part of the so-called developing countries that I've been forced to think about a lot of issues about the power dynamics of, uh, of knowledge production. That is, because I'm an academic, because I teach in, in a fairly privileged university uh, in, uh, in North America, the University of Toronto, I have access to a lot of resources. And when I work with colleagues, I was often surprised at how little uh, they have in terms of equipment, uh, uh, finances, uh, uh, classrooms, and and, and uh, uh, access to scientific literature. Uh, and so my university spent millions and millions of dollars on subscription uh, to scientific articles. And uh, when I went to India the first time, they had a handful of journals on the shelves, and that's about it. Uh, and that is not, hasn't changed that dramatically over the last 20 years, despite uh, the internet and so forth. But uh, things have changed also very positively in many respects uh, with regard to open access. And I want to build on my own experience with open access and, and ask some questions about uh, what it is that uh, we're, we're advocating and, and what does that have to do with development. Uh, if I haven't make it clear, I also teach in a development studies program. Uh, in, in addition to understanding the power dynamics of academic production, uh, I'm interested in using that academic knowledge, uh, production of academic knowledge as a case studies that reflect on the larger pictures of global inequality. That is, the inequality of the power dynamics of academic institutions really is a mirror of the inequality of institution in other situations. So when you take about big pharmacies, uh, uh, big corporations, and other kind of uh, uh, mono monopolistic power that have uh, control over resources and over people's livelihood, uh, uh, academics institution is really very much a mirror of that despite the fact that we think we're highly liberal. So I want to unpack this question about what, 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 what we mean by using open science to, to interrogate development. Uh, and I also want to take this opportunity to introduce uh, a project we just recently launched a, a week or so ago, and this is a project called Open and Collaborative, Collaborative Science and Development Network. Um, and it's a project that's funded by the International Development Research Center in Canada uh, with the intention of funding a number of projects that are going to be based in developing countries to explore the question of what is open science, what can we learn from open science, what are the contexts under which these things happen, and how do we begin to collect quality data that would allow us to answer some of these very complex questions, uh, and, and particularly in a, a different, uh, in multiple contexts and in institutional environment. Uh, so we're very excited about the launch of this network, and uh, I will have time in the last 10 minutes to give you a little bit of overview, and hopefully some of you would like to find out more about and maybe even apply for funding support uh, from the network uh, project. 
Now, I, unlike uh, Paul, who has given you a very deep historical view uh, of uh, European history and how science is embedded in that uh, patronage system, uh, and, and, and uh, Alessandro giving you a more recent case study, I'm going to give you some personal reflections. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I get some, uh, a little bit uh, using my own case study in, in terms of the lessons that I've learned, uh, uh, primarily, primarily uh, through open access. Um, and in the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been also very uh, interested in, in a particular way of looking at development issues. Um, as many of the, you know, development is often measured in economic terms so that for decades, uh, the World Bank would advocate for measuring development in terms of GDP growth so that countries are ranked in terms of the GDP performances, the more GDP production, uh, the more is considered to be uh, developing. So, so development is often being predicated on uh, economic advance. And so research in science and technologies have always taken the assumptions that if you invest in, in science de and development, it will create knowledge uh, uh, and it will locally and it will uh, result in better investment in local uh, industries and, and research and institution and university and so forth. And that will in turn generate uh, economic outcomes uh, through better industries and so on and so forth. So that assumption has been a long-standing one. So investment in science is about uh, return on investment uh, to a large extent, and that would feed into the overall GDP growth. Uh, in recent years, we, we know, you know, particularly given the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis uh, began, that began in the United States and spread around the world, that that particular model of unlimited consumption and accumulations uh, 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 has, is not sustainable. It has benefited very few. And what we have seen increasingly is the growing inequality between the rich and the poor. And the rich has gotten super, super, super rich, and the poor has remained very poor. And that gap has widened even more now than it has ever been, uh, despite decades of development. So. Uh, the kind of models that has, that has been uh, in, in, in practice uh, is clearly broken. And increasingly, we, we think that the way to rethink development is to think about how we empower citizens, that how do we change the dynamics of the people uh, like you and I to be able to claim rights, to be able to assert our rights to knowledge and our rights to uh, know as a means to be uh, 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 better participate in the political process. And that is really the ways to gain a control back in terms of some of the social system and justice and so forth. Uh, I, <laughs> I have to tell this story about yesterday. I have an encounter with your uh, social system yesterday. I was walking along the street and I was drinking a bottle of, uh, you know, bottled water and accidentally the cap of my bottle fell off and I must have kicked it while I was walking and the, the bottle cap uh, must have traveled in front of me. And very quickly, there were two people that came out of the corner. One is the, this municipal guard with very heavy police <laughs> uh, uniform and the other guy, you know, with this, all these badges and so forth. Uh, they asked me for my passport number and so forth. And of course, I had no idea what they want, wanted my passport and so forth. They gave me this weird piece of paper to look at. And it's only in Portuguese. I have no idea what it was about. And I was not about to give them my passport number. So they followed me back to the hotel, insisted I give them the passport. I ended up calling the Canadian embassy, thinking that the Canadian embassy would do something for me. So I got the Consulate General uh, of Canada to talk to these guys. In the end, they in their insistence that because I was intending to litter, uh, that they were not going to let me go without taking my um, passport number and giving me a ticket. Uh, and the Council General of Canada in the end said, just give them the number, you should be okay. So, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I just thought, okay, here's a system where uh, fairly, you know, privileged person like myself traveling is confronted with a system where I feel completely powerless, even with, with the help of the embassy. 
uh, and I have no way to challenge that system I mean, I mean, without having to have a great deal of cost in terms of time, in terms of potential uh, other consequences. It's just better to say, give in, give them my passport, maybe have to pay a ticket fine so that I can leave the country or something. Uh, so that kind of power structure is something that we confront all the time, but so sometimes more blatantly, sometimes less so. But an ordinary citizen without recourse to resources, to education, to the rights to knowledge, have absolutely no way of dealing with system of power like that. How do they go find out what it is that they're, they're confronting? And I think to me, uh, uh, one of the key issues about development is individuals, the citizens' rights to be a question and to question not only authority, but to question authority of, authority of knowledge. And that in order to do so, they not only want to be able to access knowledge, but to be able to participate in the making of knowledge. That to me is what I would refer to as the rights-based approach uh, uh, to knowledge uh, and to development. And uh, as I thought through this kind of process over the years, uh, I also began to think about what this thing called research is, because research is really a, a funny thing, uh, and it's different for different disciplines, right? Biologists, molecular biologists, uh, social scientists have all different ways of doing research, and we all think our way of doing research is right or logical or makes sense, but when someone from another discipline look at the way we do research, they say, you guys are crazy, you make no sense at all, right? This would be better to do it this way or that way. So we all think we know what we're doing when we do research, or, or at least if we're honest, we say we're just muddling our way through. But, um, but we all struggle with this idea of research. And when we teach students how to do research, we are also passing on certain assumptions, certain uncertainties, and a whole, deal, whole great deal of assumption and ideological baggages, uh, some of which Paul has identified. So uh, I've become also very interested in looking critically uh, at the notion of research itself. What does it mean to do research uh, and what does it mean to do open research and open science uh, from a critical standpoint? And, and ultimately, could these kind of reflection and new practices and challenging ourselves to rethink research and science, could these then help us transform the power dynamics between those who have powers and those who do not have powers? Um, I meant to show this slide earlier. Most of you know who Ban Ki-moon is, the current UN Gen Secretary General. Uh, and he also admitted that, that the, the current model of development is broken, and what we need is a, a more equitable uh, system and vision. Uh, uh, strive for a healthier planet uh, with less pollution, and, and a kind of dynamic inclusiveness uh, that would in, uh, that is not only relying on certain modes of uh, capitalist production. Uh, and so uh, open science to me is to a large extent about that as well. So to rethink a more equitable system of knowledge productions and communication. Uh, and the old model, uh, 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 I, would, I would disagree with my colleague Alessandro this way, and it's not that it's stable, it's just that it's the power structure that be that has been maintaining that status quo. It's not stable, it's actually very, very shaky. Uh, and this is the world as we know it, uh, and this is the world as seen, seen through the lens of the uh, journal citation uh, uh, impact factor. Uh, this data is slightly old, this is about 10 years old data, uh, but I think you all get the picture. So this is based on uh, how journals are being ranked, indexed by the uh, Thomson uh, Journal Citation Index. The more uh, uh, countries that have journals that are ranked and indexed by ISI, the bigger proportionally it shows up in that country. And by the same token, the less articles that are indexed by ISI coming from those countries, they are the, the smaller they appear. So in this case, you notice the United States is very fat, and so is Europe and Japan. Uh, you, you may not recognize them, but uh, the whole of Africa is like a pencil, as a colleague of mine calls it. A pencil thin, it, and it's not for South Africa. Uh, the continent is invisible. Now, Brazil is kind of visible a little bit, that green thing there on the side there. Uh, and through other effort like Cialo, if we were to remap some of these open access journals that are now indexed by ISI, we might see a different picture uh, in terms of that dynamic. 
But my point here is simply that if you look at the world through a certain kind of lens, and in this case, the ISI Journal Impact Factor, as the lens to measure what is supposed to be a value in terms of knowledge production, you see a particular world that is distorted, tip, tip, tip completely uh, uh, in favor of the norm. And this is where the term global south becomes much more um, poignant because you can see the contrast between the, the north and the south in very, very uh, straight contrast. Uh, again, this is, doesn't mean that there's no knowledge produced in other parts of the world. It's just those knowledge are not being valued through the same system. Uh, and so the questions that we would like to entertain through the Open Science Project is, what kind of lens should we create? What kind of lens that would allow us to see the world in a, in a different way, in a newly distorted way, but in ways that we can understand that would bring in the kind of neglected issues and so forth? Um, and how can network itself help us do that? Now, uh, let's not pretend that the network hasn't changed things, right? So, so in our own s lifetime, the, 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 the network itself have uh, came only the web, as mentioned before, is only 20 years old, but have changed the way we, we live, changed the way we, 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 we interact with each other, changed the way we, we make a, a living, and changed the way we do science and communicate science. Uh, and so uh, it is radically different. Um, I can't help also to point out that this project that we were involved with in the early days of the web, my colleagues and I thought, okay, with this thing called the World Wide Web, when we have a bunch of these journals in the developing countries that we cannot get to other parts of the world because of the high cost of print and so forth, why don't we digitize these things and put it on the web and see what happened? And from 1993, we grew to quite a number of journals over the years. Um, now, in 1993, I was only 12 years old then, but you get the picture. That's not true. Uh, so, uh, We've learned a number of lessons in terms of uh, those early days of putting stuff on the web. And, and, and I, I just, um, contrary to I, what I was told, oh, those journals, no one's going to pay attention to them. They're from Africa, they're from India, uh, they're from Brazil, who cares? Because we want journals from Harvard, we want journals from Yale, we want journals from Cambridge and Oxford and so forth. Uh, but what we found over the years is that, in fact, there's huge demand for uh, for knowledge coming out from other parts of the world, particularly knowledge that are relevant to other researchers and people from, uh, from uh, co contexts that are similar to those research contexts. So if you have high, co high, high uh, medical journal, expensive medical journals that are given away to uh, people I I in, in, um, in, in Mozambique, uh, and the doctors are cannot make use of this information because their hospital structures are so poor that a lot of those techniques they talk about in terms of operations and so forth are simply irrelevant because the medications and the operating equipment is just not there. So, so those kind of knowledge transfer are meaningless because what we call the absorptive capacity, that is the ability to uh, take those knowledge and make them into useful uh, uh, actions uh, are not there. So we need to understand the absorptive capacity of the places that we're dealing with uh, in order to do that. Now, can the network help us better understand uh, network, uh, the, the absorptive capacity, and can the network actually help build the absorptive capacity uh, of, of different uh, contexts? Uh, this is where the whole web been something that we've been trying to, to, to grapple with in terms of the kind of new economic models that is being made possible. Uh, Johai Benkler has called uh, this kind of new economy the network information economy. And this book, many of you might have heard of before. If not, I would strongly urge you to, to take a look at it. It's completely free online, and there are wiki versions that are highly annotated. Uh, in this book, uh, Bankler, this is one of the first books that really systematically look at the emerging network information em economy, and in which he argues that the kind of industrial model of, of knowledge production is no longer uh, uh, valid because of the way we deal with each other through networks, uh, through pure commons-based productions. Uh, open source is, is, is a primary example that he used, but he also used Wikipedia as an example, and he asked this very interesting question. He said, what does Wikipedia got to do with people who have no access to drinking water? 
Uh, now, by that, he doesn't mean that somehow Wikipedia will magically bring water to the people who don't have access to water. By, by that, he really was asking whether peers production could mean something to the people who do not have access to clean water. That is, the way you operate to produce knowledge, could it be used in the same way to produce access to other kind of public goods, such as wa water, such as uh, education, such as health? That is, could a, could a non-market-based non model help us uh, lead to better provision and distribution of goods through a peers production model that is analogous to that of Wikipedia? And if so, what would that look like? And again, this is the million dollar question. Uh, I meant to show you this earlier, sorry. Um, this, this is the byline thing I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are the kind of journals, partners we've been working with from, from different parts of the world. And I just grabbed a screenshot from an Google Analytics yesterday and look at who was reading the journal articles from our system and you can see that uh, all people from all over the world, particularly in countries and in, in cities that are considered developing countries, are, are accessing our databases regularly. And I got these cities break down. In fact, most of the top cities, I can't, I, the first ones is not resolved, are from the developing world. So, uh, so this tells us that there's great demand for reading these articles, great demand by the people who want to put these research out. But what we don't know is what are people doing with these articles? They're downloading them, right? they're reading them hopefully, uh, but then what are they doing with these materials beyond reading them? We'd like to know, and those are the kind of research questions uh, we like to address. And also, uh, are we seeing a new kind of dynamics? Whereas in the past, we saw the knowledge transfer from the north to the south. Uh, are we seeing the kind of knowledge transfer because of network of a more horizontal kind of knowledge transfer through real network without the centralized uh, hierarchical model so that every center could become literally, or every node could become a center, so to speak, depending on the kind of expertise they have to provide. And this is one of the questions we're gonna find, find out now. There are lots of interesting study in recent years that are helping us think through these things. So this book here just came out, the one on the wealth of the commons, a, a collection of scholars, 70 some odd scholars that work in different areas of resource common, thinking about non-market production and how they may work in different settings. The book on the one on the internet success, it's just a, pub, it's just a book just recently published uh, and it's uh, a two scholar looking at open source uh, 7,000 projects that are archived on SourceForge, and he look at how, how many of these projects succeeded and how many of them fail, and look at the commonalities, factors, critical uh, governance issues, and so forth, that make those projects successful, and what makes projects fail. And so they already have a very interesting set of theoretical framework uh, that is based on the frameworks called uh, uh, institutional analysis and development frameworks that's developed by a famous economist by the name of Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who passed away a few years ago and before she got, well, I think she got the Nobel Prize in economics before she, she passed away. But before she, she passed away, she was also starting to think of uh, knowledge as a form of commons. So how can you, we think about knowledge the same way we think about other kinds of resource commons and the kind of governance framework for those kind of resource commons, could they be applicable to uh, the kind of knowledge commons we're talking about in terms of scientific productions and network-based collaboration? I'm also happy to see that there are science policy makers that are also chiming in in the discussion that there are science policy maker that sees that because infrastructures are the traditional infrastructures, the lab and the so forth, uh, are poor in many institution, uh, it is important that these uh, uh, infrastructure be created in a, in a different way. And network seems to be the solution to some of these. And this book uh, has some number of case studies that uh, document how network is re providing the kind of uh, interconnected infrastructures that were not possible before. By the way, all these slides are on SlideShare. There's a, there's a link I put at the beginning of it. So if you, if you go to my Twitter account, you'll find a SlideShare. There's all the slides are already online. Um, and, and in addition to the scholar who look at commons-based resource, the development agencies, including the IDRC, are very actively engaged in looking at uh, um, this whole notion of openness and how it affects development. 
And so this is a recent book, again, freely online, that uh, look at uh, openness as a model or a hypothesis uh, to see how uh, the ubiquity of the network and the different kinds of intellectual property regimes, there are the non-patent and open uh, uh, licensings, uh, providing alternatives for different kind of livelihood, different kinds of uh, well-being uh, improvements and so forth. So this book has a, quite a number of examples. Now that comes to the last thing I want to say, which is the, the same agency, the IDRC, is funding this uh, open and collaborative science development network. Uh, and uh, we're very excited about this. A number of the people involved in the network, uh, some of you whom you'll be, you'll be, you will be speaking as well, Cameron Nalen, Matthew Todd, and Denise Akiras, uh, uh, Alex, all, all been involved with the, with the planning of this uh, network. And we're looking for projects from around the world uh, that would do uh, demonstrate uh, or provide data or critical theories or concepts that look at uh, the notion of open science uh, and how it relates to development. Uh, so you can go to the website uh, to find out more about the aims. We're really trying to find out whether open science, if and whether, uh, and under what conditions uh, it provides uh, the development uh, uh, solutions and, and how do we uh, frame those issues in such a way that they are also scalable uh, and, and that they have downstream impact in terms of policy engagement. Uh, we want to uh, really, well, look at some of these issues, uh, both from an empirical standpoint and from also from a theoretical standpoint, uh, so that uh, we want to look at the whole process of, of, of uh, scientific research life cycle. And then when I say scientific, I don't mean just the laboratory science. I mean all areas of inquiry. So including, I, I, I'm a social scientist, so uh, I, I just use science very broadly as systematic form of inquiry, uh, evidence-based um, um, uh, approach to, to knowledge. So science is just very broadly uh, 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 framed that way. So I don't think that because you're not a natural scientist or biological scientist that you're not part of this network. So I'd like you to think more, more broadly. So um, I think I've run out of time. So I won't give you all the details, but I want to just give you, make sure that I give you the address. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I said that one of the things we're trying to do is to have a theoretical framework that would allow us to bring together these very diverse kind of uh, phenomena. You know, some people could be doing open seeds, you know, sharing open, uh, sharing open source seed. Some people could be doing open source drug discovery. Some people could be doing open educational resources. Some could be doing uh, very, very different kinds of phenomena, the hacking, open hacking or biohacking. Uh, all these kind of things, do, what do they have in common? Well, what can they tell us about um, uh, some downstream impact? And we're beginning to create a more coherent set of uh, mechanisms to identify who are the actors, what are the institutional settings, what are the me common mechanisms, and what are the policy issues that enable different uh, kind of uh, dynamics and processes to flourish on the one hand or to stifle them on the other. So we can begin to categorize or catalog these kind of activities. Uh, and we're going to try to at least built on uh, some of those existing framework. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom's, uh, the institutional a uh, uh, analysis and development framework is one example. I'd be very interested in going back to Paul David's framework, for example, of open science and, and remap some of the current things to see whether they uh, help us work through some of the institutional issues. Uh, and these are all questions that are, that are, that are open. Uh, and as I said, but the network is only beginning. We just literally launch it. And these are just frameworks that we're working with. These are all working hypotheses. And it will change over time. And I welcome you to come to the website uh, and read the material. If you want to join the network in one way or the other, we really welcome your input. Uh, bring us your project or bring us attention to projects you think are relevant to us. Critique us. Tell us where we go wrong. Uh, how we can do better and how we can collaborate better. Thank you. É, eu vou ler para tentar ser objetiva, né? 
Bom, eu acho que entender o significado do atual movimento pela ciência aberta implica reconhecer sua inserção no contexto mais amplo da existência de uma forte tensão entre a socialização do conhecimento, da informação e da cultura de um lado e sua privatização de outro. Por um lado, temos, desde fins do século XX, o alargamento dos mecanismos de, de apropriação privada da produção intelectual e cultural, tanto pelo endurecimento dos instrumentos de proteção da propriedade intelectual, como por meio de novas formas e estratégias de captura, apropriação e valorização dessa produção coletiva. Por outro lado, desenvolvem-se novas práticas e espaços de interação, de produção colaborativa, expressando importantes inovações sociais nas dinâmicas produtivas, políticas e culturais, as quais se valem das novas plataformas digitais. Partindo desse cenário, eu queria propor uma abordagem que se desenvolve em torno de dois grandes conjuntos de argumento. Primeiro, o de que essa tensão constitui um dos principais pontos de antagonismos e lutas que movem as atuais mudanças no que alguns chamam de capitalismo cognitivo, capitalismo digital, sociedade informacional, economia da informação, do conhecimento e do aprendizado. Segundo, o de que devemos olhar essa questão, principalmente como um dos cernes da questão e da construção da democracia nas sociedades contemporâneas. Então, é dessa perspectiva que eu proponho aqui pensar o debate e o embate em torno do movimento pela ciência aberta. Considero que essa temática se investe de um caráter que é diretamente político, sendo central nas relações de poder nas sociedades contemporâneas, como já foi extensamente dito aqui. Implica superar a perspectiva de pensar a ciência e a mudança técnica a partir simplesmente da sua produtividade intrínseca ou centralmente por sua eficácia econômica, colocando foco nas relações entre ciência e poder, ou mais amplamente, entre saber e poder. Trata-se, em primeiro lugar, de um debate e de um embate no plano das significações. Ciência aberta é um termo guarda-chuva que engloba diferentes tipos de práticas e abordagens e que também permite múltiplas e, por vezes, conflituosas interpretações. Ela mobiliza frequentemente interesses e pontos de vista em antagonismo. De um lado, o regime de proteção de direitos de propriedade intelectual ancora-se em uma narrativa teórica e em um regime discursivo, fundados, em boa medida, no, no ideário que procura legitimar os direitos de propriedade do cor. A extensão de direitos de propriedade para o âmbito da produção intelectual amplia e aprofunda relações capitalistas de mercado para áreas que até então constituíam uma reserva social. No centro do discurso da propriedade intelectual está o paradigma do autor individual como criador de novo conhecimento. A essa concepção contrapõe-se, primeiramente, a ideia de que todo novo conhecimento advém de conhecimento prévio e, sendo um produto social, seu valor não é inteiramente atribuível a nenhum autor em particular. As atuais justificativas para direitos de propriedade intelectual dirigem-se menos para os direitos de autores e inventores como criadores de conhecimento e mais para os incentivos econômicos para a reprodução de objetos de conhecimento, beneficiando não indivíduos criadores, mas empresas. De outro, advoga-se que a ciência aberta promove o aumento dos estoques de conhecimento público, propiciando não apenas a ampliação dos índices gerais, índices gerais de produtividade científica e de inovação, como também das taxas de retornos sociais dos investimentos em ciência e tecnologia. Além disso, tem se demonstrado historicamente que é no compartilhamento e na abertura de modo coletivo e não individual que ocorre a criatividade e a inovatividade, hoje valendo-se das infraestruturas de conexão e interação em redes. É nesse mesmo quadro que se projetam abordagens e práticas análogas como as de cocriação, e science, produção peer-to-peer, -peer, produção wiki, crowdsourcing, co-inovação, inovação aberta, entre outras. A necessidade de resolução de problemas de alta complexidade e os elevados custos da pesquisa tem movido boa parte dos pesquisadores 
a buscar colaboração direta, frequentemente por meios interpessoais e informais, a despeito dos limites macro e meso-institucionais. A formalização de redes de colaboração interinstitucionais enfrenta barreiras que frequentemente levam ao engessamento da pesquisa e do intercâmbio de conhecimentos e informações na contracorrente da, hoje, da, da agilidade hoje propiciada pelas novas plataformas de informação e comunicação. Em paralelo, a difusão das atuais redes infocomunicacionais e da cultura livre digital contamina as formas de produzir e circular conhecimento e informação em ciência. Alguns entendem que estaríamos testemunhando a expansão de um novo tipo de intersubjetividade em torno de uma atividade coletiva de trabalho a que se, deve, a se adere voluntariamente. Motivações não meramente instru instrumentais ou por ganhos materiais, mas pela gratificação e o bem-estar psicológico, pela conectividade social. Assim, multiplicam-se e difundem é, relações e formas de produção não proprietárias com maior autonomia dos participantes e em formatos não necessariamente estruturados e hierarquizados, traços que sempre foram mais marcantes na produção e circulação da informação e do conhecimento do que na produção material. A cultura hacker é emblemática desse paradigma de produção colaborativa. É uma forma de vida que comanda esse movimento de resistência. Por outro lado, se esse movimento incrementa a produção coletiva, abre também novas frentes e brechas à captura privada dessa informação e conhecimento coletivamente produzidos. Trata-se, portanto, de um embate entre distintas formas de apropriação, social e privada. Novos modelos de negócio desenvolvem-se em torno da ideia do conhecimento aberto, seja ciência, tecnologia, inovação, ou mesmo a produção cultural. A propriedade intelectual, porém, ao mesmo tempo em que captura, também bloqueia essa potência produtiva da ciência e de modo mais amplo do conhecimento e da cultura, extraindo valor, sobretudo, da interrupção dos movimentos de, co de cooperação. Esse capitalismo né, ele sobrevive da exploração parasitária e rentista da produção coletiva, oferecendo condições para sua reprodução, como nas plataformas gratuitas de acesso às redes digitais, ao mesmo tempo que estraga essa própria dinâmica da valorização. De um lado, a propriedade intelectual necessita impor-se por meio do comando e do controle, exigindo um aparato repressivo que procura compensar ou mitigar a fragilidade de uma legislação que se revela anacrônica e inaplicável nas atuais dinâmicas produtivas. De outro, a mercantilização do conhecimento e da informação requer a continuidade da polinização, que, por sua vez, pressupõe liberdade em processos de contínua ressocialização do conhecimento. Nesse sentido, os instrumentos de propriedade intelectual em seu atual formato já não cabem mais no novo paradigma. São mecanismos de escassez artificial de algo que não se esgota, mas que, ao contrário, se fertiliza e se reproduz na livre troca e nas interações em um regime de acumulação baseado na produção de conhecimento por meio de conhecimento para gerar, gerar valor. Assim, na contracorrente dos novos cercamentos do que é produzido em comum, coloca-se a crise de execução das relações de propriedade. Na era das redes e do acesso, os próprios marcos jurídicos tradicionais de propriedade são postos em xeque. Outro aspecto diz respeito a se a ciência aberta orienta-se basicamente para uma relação estrita e restrita ao chamado campo científico, ou se, alternativamente, refere-se à abertura da ciência, à interseção e mesmo à intervenção de diferentes e outros tipos de saberes, a sua relação com a alteridade, com o outro. Entende-se dessa ótica que a geração de informação e conhecimento relevantes à ciência, tecnologia e inovação constitui cada vez mais processo que se espalha pela sociedade inteira, uma produção coletiva na qual participam múltiplos atores e agentes, suas dinâmicas de experimentação e aprendizado coletivo, 
cruciais são as sinergias entre informações e conhecimentos formalizados e ditos avançados e de outros saberes não formalizados, construídos nas práticas sociais, muitos até então considerados saberes sujeitados. Aqui, o novo papel do conhecimento não remete simplesmente à nova centralidade da ciência ou de uma classe criativa. Trata-se, sobretudo, da socialização do conhecimento por meio da produção coletiva de uma intelectualidade difusa. Algo que se desenvolve e produz não mais em estoques, mas, fundamentalmente, fluxos. Desta perspectiva, a ciência aberta é algo que requer e promove fluidificar a circulação de informações, lubrificando o processo de produção de conhecimento, o saber coletivo sendo feito de conexões na diversidade. Por fim, cabe ainda indagar se no, da, no debate e nos embates em torno da ciência aberta estão também em questão distintas perspectivas geopolíticas, geoeconômicas e geoculturais, e ainda distintas posições e interesses de diferentes segmentos sociais. Coloca-se aqui a indagação que ciência aberta, para que tipo de desenvolvimento, para quem? Os pobres são certamente os mais afetados pelos sistemas de apropriação privada de conhecimento e pelas patentes em particular, principalmente em áreas sensíveis como a de medicamentos, agricultura e alimentação, na medida em que esses sistemas elevam artificialmente os preços de produto, o que certamente afeta mais os pobres não difundem amplamente os benefícios dos avanços do conhecimento, sobretudo para os pobres. Enviesam os focos da pesquisa para a área de interesses dos ricos e não dos pobres. Colocam barreiras à pesquisa e logo à inovação, particularmente em áreas de interesse dos pobres. A ciência aberta coloca neste aspecto em pauta uma nova agenda de direitos, sejam eles humanos e sociais, sejam também direitos que visam garantir a sustentabilidade e a sobrevivência da vida de modo amplo. A questão da propriedade intelectual deixa, então, de pertencer a uma arena meramente técnica, de interesse limitado a especialistas, para mobilizar um amplo espectro de atores sociais que veem suas vidas diretamente afetadas por esse aparato legal. Esses direitos tocam em áreas que vão da produção cultural à produção científico-tecnológica, passando pela saúde, o meio ambiente, a alimentação e a agricultura, entre outros. Amplia-se a consciência de que a legislação que regula esses direitos tem efeitos que vão muito além dos econômicos. Ela media diretamente a experiência humana, o bem-estar e a liberdade, regulando do modo como podemos aprender, pensar e criar juntos até como e se temos acesso a medicamentos e alimentos que precisamos para viver. O modo de produção em rede abre, então, oportunidades para novos ciclos de lutas, onde a, parti a partir de uma mesma infraestrutura. Trata-se, então, de alternativas complementares ou em disputa? Coloca-se em questão em que consistem formas novas e inovadoras de constituição e instituições do comum ou da ciência nos, no, como um dos bens comuns. Inovações institucionais e sociais que permitam proteger o que é coletiva e socialmente produzido da sua apropriação é, privada serão cruciais para lidar com as questões que se colocam nesse momento de crise e transformação. Assim, no desenvolvimento da ciência, atuam não apenas fatores de ordem técnica, como a disponibilidade de plataformas computacionais e infraestrutura tecnológica para compartilhamento de dados, mas também fatores institucionais, normativos, políticos e culturais. Os esforços de ciência aberta envolvem instâncias de ação e decisão diferenciadas, que vão desde o pesquisador individual até o nível macro das políticas públicas e das regulações internacionais, passando pelo nível meso das instituições de pesquisa e agências de fomento. Mais importantes são os novos usos que implicam em transformações nos métodos e estruturas lógicas da pesquisa e, logo, em seus resultados, em um processo de aprendizado e inovação contínuos. 
Boa parte dessas questões diz respeito aos mecanismos de governança, mais especificamente de governança informacional, entre os vários é, participantes, o que, mais uma vez, remete às formas de gestão e resolução de conflitos e de poder. Postas essas premissas, eu tenho me colocado, então, como ponto, questões de pesquisa, algumas indagações. Quais os significados que se tem atribuído e que se podem atribuir à ciência aberta? Trata-se de um novo modo ou paradigma de fazer ciência? O que tem motivado a propagação desse movimento? Ou seja, que interesses estão né, em jogo? Que novas práticas, experiências e formatos de pesquisa têm se desenvolvido nesse quadro? Em que elas repercutem nas formas de produção, circulação e uso da informação e conhecimento em ciência? Quais têm sido seus principais avanços, obstáculos e resultados? Que fatores impulsam e dificultam seu desenvolvimento? Em que medida e com que mecanismos abrem-se novas possibilidades de interlocução entre diferentes tipos de saberes? Que novas institucionalidades e estruturas são necessárias nesse contexto? Em que medida essas práticas repercutem nas relações entre informação, conhecimento e poder? Quais suas repercussões para se pensar novos estilos de desenvolvimento que coloquem a questão da democracia social, política, cultural no seu âmago? Que novidades, oportunidades e desafios colocam seu Brasil nesse cenário? Que condições devem ser estabelecidas e que políticas e estratégias devem ser traçadas ante este quadro? Portanto, eu acho que o que eu deixo são mais perguntas do que propriamente soluções. Muito obrigada. Fala no microfone e se identifica, por favor. Boa tarde, eu sou Henrique Parra, é, da Universidade Federal de São Paulo, e também parabenizar os colegas pelas instigantes apresentações. É, eu queria aproveitar ah, as, as perspectivas que foram apresentadas, eu acho que trouxe um, um debate, realmente, é, coloca um, um problema é, na perspectiva internacional, e, e eu acho que é a partir daí que eu fiquei com algumas, ah, na verdade, pensando junto, né, algumas questões de ordem da geopolítica. Não é? É, e aí, pegando também, acho que a última intervenção da Sarita colocou muito claro, e acho que várias das questões que estão em jogo. Né? Então, é um pouco, é, eu gostaria que os demais ah, palestrantes, né, o Leslie, o Tian, ah, o Alessandro e ah, o Paul, pudessem também comentar um pouco a partir da análise que eles estão fazendo, né, como que eles estão pensando essas questões, não é, da, da convivência desses sistemas? Uh, o Paul falou no, na, na combinação de um sistema, não é, uh, de propriedade intelectual ao mesmo tempo com um sistema de open access, não é? é como que a gente, a gente pode olhar para essa questão, tendo em vista que o sistema de propriedade intelectual ele está muito ancorado numa questão dos estados-nação. Depende de uma questão territorial. É claro que há todos os acordos internacionais que regulam o sistema de propriedade, mas há uma questão aí do estado-nação fortíssima. Ao mesmo tempo, nós temos as grandes corporações, caráter transnacional, atuando nos países, e a forma como elas gerenciam digamos, a propriedade intelectual ela, enfim, é transnacional. Não é? Então, é dizer, a gente pensar questões, não é, seja uh, do livre acesso, né, que, ou do commons, que também exige uma, um, um regime institucional, né, de proteção à comunidade é, política que a cria e a participa, né, é, como que vocês estão pensando essas questões no plano dessa dessa convivência, não é, que não é nada pacífica, ao contrário, não é, quer dizer você tem uh, estados nacionais competindo entre si, não é, então quer dizer isso repercute internamente na forma como eles vão regular o acesso ou não ao conhecimento produzido. Não é? I don't know much about intellectual property rights uh, and, and alternative licensings and all those kind of things, even though I try to read them and follow them. Uh, and I follow the debate at the World Intellectual Property Organization and the development agenda that some of my colleagues are involved with in terms of advocacies, in terms of um, exceptions and so forth. And what we're seeing uh, is that, that rising tension, right? Increasing power of the multinational to dictate terms that then are imposed across national boundaries. Uh, and so this is 
this is more and more of a citizen's rights as well, going back to my argument earlier about citizens' rights. And I think most people are not aware of how their rights are increasingly being in, taken away by these, these uh, very, very powerful uh, 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 harmonized policy across countries. So, uh, so at the first instant, we need to draw attention to them, how they may impact in terms of access to, to medicines, to all kinds of, of public goods, uh, and also uh, uh, advocate for alternative kind of regime. There's a project, you can look it up on the internet, it's called the Open African Innovation Research and Training. Open African Innovation Research and Training is Open Air for short, uh, and they they've been doing research in that very area in terms of looking at alternative uh, 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 licensing regimes of of uh, of, of um, I hate to use the term intellectual property, but of scientific output and other intellectual outputs using different kinds of uh, licensing schemes that would benefit South Africa rather than. Uh, somebody else. Yeah. So take a look at some of the research reports. Yeah. So, uh, why is it turned off? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, it's it's a very difficult uh, question for me because my my skills are not that that uh, uh, wide. Um, I want to say that in, 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 I mean, while while you face on, on one side the, the the of course transnational scope scope of of, of multinational corporations and uh, global agreements and intellectual property rights and so on, it's difficult to see something emerging from from grassroots movements. But still, it is, I think that both movements of, of of opinion and of action in the world of of commons are, are important to to change things, even at the policy level. Uh, so I think it's important to, to, to push that boundary a little bit. Um, one proposal that has been circulating and I've been, I've been hearing, which, which will be interesting as one of the maybe steps that could allow us to uh, build sort of an infrastructure to protect the commons would be to, to have uh, a foundation that would, that would operate sort of like, sort of like the, the Free Software Foundation or, or the, the, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, but devoted to the global commons. That would be, that would be very interesting. So an international organization that will take, uh, put money and, and advocacy and, and lawyers and, and, and think tanks and so on into the, the global, the, the, the evolution of the, 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 the expansion of the global commons. That would be a, a great uh, achievement and maybe, uh, who knows, sooner or later. de que o, você perguntou mais para os outros, né? a, única, a única coisa que eu agregaria é o seguinte, eu acho que a gente precisa de novas institucionalidades, tanto no plano interno dos países, quanto nas relações geopolíticas em, é, em termos mundiais, e é que essa, na verdade, mas esse aparato institucional ele é um reflexo das lutas, ou seja, as lutas é que são os movimentos sociais, as pressões sociais, é que, de algum modo, vão poder ou não fazer alguma transformação é, nesse aparato. Né? Eu acho que o aparato, o aparato institucional, na verdade, ele reflete um determinado momento de relação de forças na, na, nas sociedades, nas relações entre os países. Então, eu acho que tudo depende de como, em que medida, essa é uma questão que toca a sociedade, e que essa sociedade se coloca né, e, 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 e impõe né, e pressiona para haver transformações nesse aparato legal. on the topic which we were pursuing, but there's a ge some general comment. No, I was... I oh, in response to that. No, I thought that the, que the responses were, so far, were... Are uh, there any more questions? <coughs> um, Cameron Aylan, boss. So, uh, in, part, in part, in response to that, and in part also to the... the the point Paul was making at near the end that we have a there's this tension fundamentally it's kind of, I'll, I'll use an example um, in Europe at the moment we are doing two things at the same time um, we're trying to construct 
reconstruct contractually a commons through licensing arrangements like Creative Commons um, in the same way that Paul, Paul touched on. And at the same time, we're arguing two contradictory things. One is that text and data mining shouldn't, isn't subject to copyright legislation. And the other is that it should be um, accepted from copyright legislation. And I wonder, I, I don't, don't have an answer, but um, one of the things that I wonder is when we pursue all three of those strategies at the same time, and we do so in a narrow geographical and legal context, we're often opening ourselves up for issues across these jurisdictions. Um, so we're appropriating tools, we're, we're reappropriating copyright on one side um, in, a, in, a, in a political context, um, the, the reappropriation of those tools is an interesting thing, but at the same time we're making ourselves subject to them. Um, and our choices to do that in Europe can obviously have a, a big effect on how that plays out in the wider world. So I don't think I've, I've not simplified the issue at all, but I think it's a really important one. This is very. This is an. It's an important. It's an important point that that Cameron has has raised, which proceeds uh, from, I think, two two levels of uh, of misunderstanding. Uh, one uh, one is a misunderstanding uh, about the importance uh, of new forms of licensing intellectual property um, and that is uh, sort of the notion that uh, we have to that we have to use uh, different different kinds of licensing and different kinds of, uh, of contracts in the form of something like copy copyleft uh, because copyright uh, is, uh, uh, is is uh, injurious uh, to the uh, to the uh, easy uh, development of easy and open access. Uh, the, uh, the, this, you know, the, the second, uh, I think, uh, lack of understanding is that uh, uh, the copyright license uh, developed to support open source, whether that's GPL or of the variants of that license is the key uh, to opening uh, uh, the development of software uh, to uh, large collaborative organizations and can be the key uh, to similarly opening a scientific activity uh, so that it can enjoy the same power and benefit uh, which was suddenly displayed by an alternative means of producing uh, software. Uh, we could have a long conversation on this, but uh, let me did sort of declare sort of uh, my, my view about this. First, uh, one has to understand uh, that open source software which uses uh, uh, copyleft licenses is based on the power of copyright law. It is copyright law which allows uh, licenses to be repurposed for different ends than they came to be uh, uh, to serve in the hands of publishing companies. Uh, that was the genius uh, of Stallman uh, in producing a different kind of license which is copyright. When, when you use open source software, you accept the license requirements, which is a license directly from you to you from the originators uh, of, the, uh, of, of the program that you're liking. It doesn't come from the person who gave you the program. It comes from them. And you are bound, therefore, you know, to do certain things uh, which will enable this, uh, ma this material uh, this knowledge or this information uh, to be reused, repurposed, uh, and transmitted to others in the same way. Okay? So without the platform 
of copyright law, which happens to be one of the most fully developed standardized systems in the law, internationally standardized systems of the law, which allowed an organization like Creative Commons uh, to think about actually generating a form of license which would be applicable across many, many uh, uh, legal jurisdictions and to get that rolled out, you couldn't have uh, the effectiveness uh, which the licenses provide. But the second point that I want to make is that the licenses were one element uh, in the success of copyright and not the most important one. The most important one were the preceding developments uh, in, in computer-mediated telecommunications networks and the fact that you began to have a wide distribution of the equipment which provided, but certainly did not universally provide, access to those networks. The networks enabled what the innovation of peer production, as, uh, as uh, uh, Jochai Bentler wanted to call it, uh, namely distributed production. It is spatially distributed production. It was production which allowed the mobilization of a mass of activity uh, to work together uh, to produce new forms of software in a different fashion. What was important in that development, in realizing it, were advances in the writing of software architectures, which realized uh, the point that was made by Herb and Simon in an important, many years ago, an important essay on the architecture of complexity that uh, the modularization was not enough uh, if you wanted people to collaborate on some building a complex uh, system. You, what you needed was semi-decomposability. The architecture had to allow people to work in a way that did not require tearing up other people's work in order to advance uh, the functional properties of the system that you were buying and in order to make it more readily dis maintain it. So my point is that w when you look at something which is a, s a success like open source, you have to understand what the conditions which enabled it to speedily uh, uh, become an alternative production regime which could be globally adopted and which could uh, allow scaling which had not been achieved before, which uh, allowed uh, open entry into large uh, software produ uh, production systems uh, because uh, it, it, it didn't matter uh, very much uh, whether people working in one module uh, would do something which would uh, create a series of loops which would not interact with the rest of the system. The modularization and the work of maintainers in the, uh, in the large projects enable that. What this means for me in this present context is first that the language that what we have in the new movement is the uh, idea of transformation of science along the lines of open source. So I think the terminology that we should use for this is a valid terminology which is uh, open, uh, open source inspired science. Okay, open source uh, restructuring of science. But, but this, and that's the last point I want to make, is that it's a difference between working with a metaphor, which is a self-contradictory statement. You know, imagine the state uh, is, an, is an organism and think of all the bad consequences of that line of thinking uh, that, uh, that emerged. But a metaphor has a life that frees you to imagine new things. And it's there a source of creativity, but it's a transient state because when you come to try to implement it, then you see that you know, the, the state is, is not uh, an organism. And the states don't belong in a, for, in a food chain like other organisms. And that if you try to implement that, you get yourself into some pretty nasty lines of thought, okay? So, there's an important distinction between a paradigm and a metaphor. And to take open source as a paradigm for science 
is, I believe, and I think uh, this is a view I expressed at an early point when I began working uh, for 10, 10 years on the proje projects on understanding how open source production works. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, John Wilbanx, with whom I discussed this, sort of wrote a very nice uh, paper in which he, uh, 19, uh, 2009, in which he said we should understand that what open source did its revolution is distributed, is distributed collaboration. It enabled that and with lots of things. So we should look at the aspects of science which can be successfully distributed in that way, which can be scaled up, which can be left open, uh, and not think uh, that simply that because it uses open source software tools, it is open source software. Software is a, is a very different animal from science for lots of reasons which, we could, which I could elaborate on and which John Wilbanks uh, articulated uh, four of them. You know, there, I think there are six. It doesn't matter. Uh, uh, four was enough. Uh, so I think it's important uh, for, to have this, motion, this movement go forward that we not get into the situation in which uh, uh, in which Alessandro's uh, paper, with which I agree everything he said except the final slide, in which he said, open science threatens open society. Uh, it threatens existing structures in society. It threatens you know, the existing regime of science. Well, I'm sorry, that's that's it. it, okay, I think because that's it. That's fine. Okay. <laughs>